Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today is a very special guest. He is a 2020 Paralympian, 21-year-old from British Swimming. Today, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Will Perry. Will, how's it going? Hello. Hello. Lovely to meet you all. sit down with you you've you've made some waves uh in your swimming career which we're going to get to it's it's certainly been a unique journey for you um especially just at 21 years old um but certainly made some waves in the last few days with an instagram post um you've 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 gone on bbc you've got you're going on sky news you're here with us now um and so can can you tell us can you take us through this post um you know you were you made it in in a state where you were upset, um, and I think rightly so, can, could you explain that post to us? So, yeah, I, well, first, thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, it was one of those days, you know, I think everyone has these days where I call it snagging clothes on door sort of thing, where you always catch something. Um, I'd lost my keys and I'd spent a good part of six hours looking for them. We were about to return to training from um, New Year. Uh, everything was about to start getting kicked off and I just couldn't find anything. And then um, I was getting calls about, you know, attending this, attending that. And I was getting really stressed out. And all I wanted to do, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to go and just get some food, get a nice drink, and then just go and relax at home. And I walked in. So we have, you know, I walked into one of our main stores, which is called Tesco. Um, it's a big, big superstore. This is, it's one of the really big ones. And as I walked in, there were three girls, about 16, 15 years old, sitting on a bench. And I could see that they were laughing and you know, sniggering at me behind their masks, looking up. And this happens every day. You know, I'm very used to it, but it pisses me off. Um, and, you know, I, I went shopping. I at first, I tried to think nothing of it, which I normally do. But when you're in a mood like that, it really, really bugs you. So I thought I'd go and confront them. Um, and when I came out, that I could see they were looking behind the glass doors, looking for me. And as soon as I came out, the heads quickly um, went back behind the door. So I went around and confronted them. Um, they said, oh, you're just having a bad day. Like You're overreacting. As I walked away, I don't know. If I, um, I won't use the same language of like, mm, uh, like, come on, uh, that, that was a bit of an overreaction. I wouldn't say specifically what they said, but I came back and I was like, come on, you think that's an overreaction? You know, you wouldn't know what that is. Um, and afterwards, you know, it's a fairly normal incident. It's fairly insignificant to what I've had before. And I got in my car and I, I really wanted to cry. I didn't, but I wanted to. I got home and I thought, what can I do? You know, you know, I'm getting fed up with this. What can we change? What can I do? And I thought, you know, we I've been to the Paralympics. Um, I don't have a massive following compared to some swimmers, but maybe I can say something and it might get shared a couple of times. So I wrote an angry post. I was pretty pissed off, which I think helps with the emotions. And Oh my God, it went viral. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, I've had, I only have two or 3,000 followers. I think it's been viewed 35, 40,000 times, which for me is unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Um, I've had the most amazing messages, people sympathizing with me, telling me their stories. I've had, you know, Paralympians, Olympians, Olympic champions, Paralympic champions message me, talk to me about it. And, you know, it's called the eye. I've, I reached out to a couple of news. I've reached out to the local newspaper and just in the hope that, you know, a couple of people might read it. And then it's caught on and on. The ultimate goal was, is obviously to eradicate this problem because it's huge. And obviously we're nowhere near achieving that, but wow, I've gotten a lot further than I thought I would. It's unbelievable. 
Yeah, that, it's certainly spread out. I think I think you may have reached out to us also just about sharing yeah. the post. Um, we're certainly grateful that you did because we're 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 happy to bring awareness to this. Um, I mean, obviously, well, maybe this isn't obvious. I, I'm have you uh, had dwarfism? You you told me the proper name for it or the scientific name for it. And I've forgotten it now. It, it is a mouthful. Um, since you were born. Yes. So it's a genetic condition. It affects, so mine is the most common. It's called achondroplasia. It affects one in 25,000 births. So mathematically, that means there's about 70,000 of us here in the UK. Um, so we're not, you know, massively rare, but yeah, so we're born with it. It's half a gene mutation. Um, it's not curable. There's nothing you can do when you're, you know, growing up medically, you're stuck with it. It's, you know, it's as changeable as your skin color. It's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And so you've had this, you, you have been dealing with this literally since birth. Um, have you ever, I mean, have you ever seen someone in your position take a stand like this? Um, as you have before no like i don't blame them i really don't blame them it's not a dig you know i haven't said anything until now um i didn't believe i had that much of an influence um especially before not you know being a paralympian or gb swimming uh you're not a nobody but you're a normal person and there's not many people who listen to normal people so i've done some research and obviously there's always someone putting something out about you know i've been bullied at school or this happened but i don't think they highlight how much this occurs you know i've got stories from some of our most famous paralympians um with dwarfism let's say ellie simmons for example i've had stories from her with abuse literally she sent me something saying the same sort of thing happened to her that day um Another really good swimmer of ours, Maisie Summers Newton, a double Paralympic champion from Tokyo. Uh, when we were walking up to Paralympic trials, we got abused. Um, you know, it happens so often. And yeah, and it's one of the things like when you're younger, you don't really realize who you are until you're a bit older. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that helps put me in a realization of who I am. You know, I've got dwarfism because these people are laughing at me because they're staring at me. And I think when you're younger, it sort of creates a negative atmosphere in your own mind about who you are. Obviously your parents inform you, yeah, well, you know, you're different. You know, you've got this, you're stuck with it. It means you're shorter You go, oh, great. And, but you're reminded in public every single day. It's, it's horrendous. It's disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I can't do anything besides agree I mean, it's that that sounds horrendous right especially in uh you know if 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 our society isn't proactive about um accepting that then then i think the natural reaction for people seeing those that are different and especially if someone is shorter um, I think a lot of times it's just viewed as inferior then they're they're going to treat them with negativity which it it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting concept. There's so much I can talk on about this. You know, I'll start with media, you know, movies, social media, things like TikTok. That's where most of the people around the world get their, you know, get their images of dwarfs, people with dwarfism. It's, you know, where they first see people like us, you know, oh, wow, these people, we yeah, had do exist. Yeah, we do exist. But it's movies like Wolf of Wall Street, where we're used as darts. Movies like Elf, where we are depicted to have particularly short and angry tantrums. Um, then we get people on social media. There's a TikToker, I don't know his name. Um, I'd like to slap him. He, uh, you know depicts himself in a derogatory way because it gets him more views it gets him more subscribers because he thinks it's funny but then he takes a pick around uh, piss out of all of us and because so many people watch that then they see someone like me 
or anyone else with dwarfism and go, actually, I wonder if he's the same. Let's make some sure ass joke about him. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there's been so many things in history and society which is not generally being accepted, looked fondly upon, or people not being really aware. And it's not the small things, it's the really big things. If you think on how far we've come with homosexuality, with racism, uh, with different kinds of religion, discrimination, um, the list goes on. And we've come so far, especially in the last couple of years, you know, with Black Lives Matter, we've gained so much attention and love and support for people struggling with racism, religion, etc. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. But what about us? We really need that love and support and knowledge too. We're, you know, for so long been suffering in silence. And I think that's why it's created such a stir when I've said this has happened. You know, so many people have shock, been shocked by it. Like, wow, I have no idea. And I was like, well, there's a bloody problem. No one knows. So this is now why, you know, I've reached out to you guys. I've reached out to other people because I believe I've got a platform of some description to eradicate this or at least kickstart something, get other people involved. It's, you know, I'm really, I really hope this is just the beginning. Yeah. And on that note, again, you've uh, talked with BBC. We're talking with you now. You're going on Sky News, which is a, a national news outlet in the UK tomorrow. Um, is, you know, obviously it's just been a couple of days, but have you thought about how, how this can steamroll or, or what you may want to do to develop this into a, a bigger platform? It's, it's really tricky because, you know, you get all sorts of activists um, and advocates for so many different causes. But the real problem is it's very easy to become annoying. And, you know, obviously there's, you know, people, I'm not going to mention any names because that's not who I am. But, you know, there's people protesting for the, you know, the, the best of causes, but people see them as annoying people because all they do is they just whinge and talk about it. That's not my aim. And if I'm being honest, I haven't got a long-term plan because this has happened so quickly you know i posted it on tuesday it's now friday i'm still working my way through the messages i'm still getting emails and phone calls from um different uh news sources and all that i have no idea how you know how to um combat this but we're starting to come up with a plan i've got a meeting tomorrow with another fellow paralympian on a possible campaign um i think the best way to solve this i think in a not a short term or long term but a sort of middle term is get big names involved you know you know the biggest names in our sport maybe others celebrities people of you know political positions as well saying actually you know what i'm hurt by this story all of us we need to come together realize what's going on and combat it you know if all it takes is one person of you know huge influence um to share it all it takes is one person and it goes bang everyone sees it everyone goes oh my god well i hope that they do 90 percent surely we go oh my god we need to you know i had no idea and this is you know it's happened on a small scale here but for this to be totally effective, it needs to happen on a really big scale. It needs to, that's why hopefully on Sky News tomorrow, I reach so many more people, hopefully people of, you know, actual proper influence. I'm quite small compared to everyone else. Um, that's the plan long term. And then I think it will help build up and up and up. I can't just do it by myself. It's got to be all of us. That's the way we combat it. So I'm, I'm, I'm obviously hoping that this does take off. Um, obviously, <laughs> we're, we're here to, uh, to aid in this process. Um, and hopefully, you know, this podcast can help reach a few more people um, and a few more fellow swimmers in, in our small community of, uh, of aquatics. Um, but on that note, I'd like to talk to you about your swimming. Um, you, have, you have a unique journey. Um, certainly you started swimming, you're 21 now, 
you started swimming when you were just 14, 15? Yeah. So um, this sort of loops in finally with, you know, dwarfism going into swimming. So I started, so we call it here senior school. Um, and you start at when you're 13 um, or 14. I can't play sports like rugby um, over here, you know, football might be, you could call it soccer um, or contact sports of any sort, because a part of our condition is that we've got a weak spine. It could be easy to break our back. So we can't play. And I was at senior school and I was, you know, I was pissing around. I didn't really know what to do with myself. I was sometimes the water boy for the football teams, or I would go and watch, you know, someone else go and play rugby. And I was told, you know, go to, mind just go to the swimming pool on Thursday afternoons, you know, just give it a go. And I can swim. I could swim at that point. You know, I was taught when I was very little, but nothing more than that. Um, and got in, did a couple of lengths. I had no goggles, a pair of baggy um, trunks on. And I was hitting the lane ropes. I had an awful stroke. My coach at that point, someone called Stuart Cowie, got me out. And he said, I'm going to get, I'm going to train you and I'm going to get you to nationals next year. So in terms of next year's and at the end of this season, and he did it. Um, I remember my 53 PB dropped in by about 11, 12 seconds in that first year. I remember doing, um, I remember going a 47 point and he told me we've got to go 45 and then you'll, we'll be talking. My PB is now 32, eight. I'm not far off the British record. Um, and in six years, where if you think about other swimmers, you've been doing this for nine or 10 years um i'm pretty astounded uh and yeah then i went to a swimming school for a year i left that uh his education wasn't really working out it wasn't really for me and then i joined northampton swimming club um which over here for paras is the place to go every para swimmer who's been in the top squad the performance one squad so far has made the Paralympic Games, which is unheard of in Britain. It's unbelievable. Um, so this year, last year, sorry, in Tokyo, it was myself, Maisie Summers-Newton, Ellie Robinson and Zara Maluli from one squad. We all share the same lane route. Um, and yeah, but the way it came about was obviously we were in lockdown this time a year ago and a list came out for you know specialist training you know special permission to go training for the commonwealth games it was a long list which i was put on and then i was given three weeks to go to paralympic to train for paralympic trials in which i had to swim a 53 pb in order to potentially make a team for europeans to be internationally classified so i had three weeks coming out of what three months off training to do a 53 pb Bearing in mind, I hadn't done a 53 PB in about two, three years. And I did it. I did it by, what, 0.4, 0.5, which was, I couldn't believe it. I was then shipped to Madeira for Europeans, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or something like that, near Africa or something like that. And I made what, two out of four finals, which for um, an international debut, I thought was all right. And then two, three days after that, I was informed I made the relay team to go on the Tokyo 2020 Games. And my mind was blown. You know, three months earlier, I wasn't an international swimmer. I was a national swimmer just, you know, hoping I'd make it in 24. And now all this has happened. It was, it's happened so fast. I'm now on a program. Um, I'm training for the Commonwealth Games this year, the World Championships. I haven't made the times yet, but that's the aim to try and make these times. It's been a complete whirlwind. I don't think anyone's gone from nothing to something that quickly. It's blown my mind. Yeah, that's that's a quick ascension. I'm sure yeah, it was it's about three months from <laughs> nothing to Paralympian. Yeah. Yeah. And so it sounds exciting. It sounds nerve wracking. It sounds like it was a lot of things. Um, when, when you went, you found out you, you're getting to go to the Paralympics. Can you tell me about the actual experience 
of going to those Paralympics? It's one of those one of those experiences that is so hard to put in words. You know, um, I know the Americans have a big team. Um, obviously, we had a fairly big team as well. Um, obviously, I don't know what it's like to represent Great Britain without COVID. I've only done it when there's been no crowds. Hmm. And because I didn't win any medals, for me, it didn't really make much of an effect because, you know, they were cheering for someone else when I got out, if they were there. Um, it was quite funny when you... I, I remember seeing someone break a world record and get a gold medal, and all you could hear was the one solitary coach clapping. It sounded something a bit sarcastic. Um, but no, the experience, you know, I, I often describe, you know, May to September of 2021, the best months of my life. It's like you're the most important person in the world. Everyone's watching you. Um, you know, everyone's, you know, oh, what, what, you know what, when you're racing, what, what are you hoping to do and all that? And, you know, uh, it makes me sad thinking about it now that, you know, we came straight out of that into, you know, a British winter where, you know, back to COVID and all that. It's just, but no, the it was such an amazing experience. I, can't get over it you know it's so hard to put into words um and it's amazing actually to see what i thought was really cool is when you're watching the olympics it's obviously there a few weeks before it's hard to imagine oh yeah i'm going to be there in three weeks time it's mad um yeah i didn't win any medals i did one final with the relay team you know it didn't deduct from the experience it was just outrageous i, I mean i especially think that your goals would play into that right the expectations of a few months earlier you weren't even going for the, the paralympic team necessarily you were just trying to make it to, to euros right or, or just trying to make it to the paralympics in 24 yeah i was just trying to, to make it that. to <laughs> paris that was it you know we hadn't factored this in you know the, if things and to be honest this is where lockdown and the postponement played into my favor i wouldn't have been ready in 20 actual 2020 um so i was one of those people that it actually benefited i used lockdown as a time to reinvent myself reinvent myself as an athlete i spent hours watching youtube reading blogs looking for people's instagram and what they do and i what i built a gym at home my brother myself and my brother we built a gym um I changed my approach to recovery. I changed my approach to nutrition. And this is where it led me. It was, I say a good use of my time. So let's, let's get into that, how you used your time, especially in that last year. Uh, what's training look like for you? You know, how many times are you hitting the water every week? What are the workouts like? How, how, you know, how long are you going? What are your focuses? Let's, let's start there. So our Northampton swimming, we're a, uh, a middle distance medley based club. We're quite unusual, but it means we're quite diverse among the events that we can do. We've got national, you know, international levels um, swimmers who are very good at breaststroke. We've got a swimmer who went to the ISL last year, um, who's a fly freestyler. Maisie and myself, we are Maisie's medley and breaststroke. I'm breaststroke and freestyle. And that's just the international swimmers. We've got over distance swimmers who's represented the country. Um, so our sets are very medley based. We always swim all four strokes each session. They're at least two hours long, sometimes two and a half hours long. Um, and I think we're in the pool. Normal swimmers are eight times a week. Some exceptionally are in nine um i personally do three gym sessions a week uh that's my own program that's separate to the clubs but we we talk and we work together um so i think all in all about 18 19 hours a week of actual swimming uh and uh you know we've got strength and conditioning physio stretching etc and it's produced an incredibly successful formula for our club i believe we won British Championships, Summer Championships in 2018. Um, we, I remember counting at one point, in a squad out of 17, eight had represented Great Britain in the last two years. Uh, it's an incredibly successful formula. We've got Andy Sharp, who is 
the director of swimming and head coach now. We used to have Jackie Marshall, who now um, works in British swimming. She was the director of swimming since 2008, and she was fantastic. Um, but the way we have such a successful formula is that everything's inclusive. So, you know, again, back to dwarfism, I hate to bring it up all the time, but it's a particularly relevant topic at the moment. We are set to adapt it, but no exceptions are made for us. So we um, tend to do three quarters of what everyone else does in terms of times and meters. Um, you know, it might not be exactly right for the science of it, but it's the easiest way and it's the way that works out the most. Um, and it's the way we can get the mo most work done. And it, I don't think it's, I don't think it's failed. I think it's produced some incredible athletes. It's produced what well, in the last five years, three gold medals, um, and a bronze and several world records, British records, Paralympic records. It goes on. None of them are mine, unfortunately, but, um, uh, yes, uh, not well, potentially fingers crossed. We don't know. Um, <laughs> I only take it a year at a time. But yes, that club I can't vouch for enough with the work we do. Um, and it always shines through when we compete. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, speaking of, of the accolades, the accomplishments, I'm curious as to your personal goals in the pool now, after having been to that Paralympics, after having that whirlwind uh, spring summer season that you did how did that change your views of, of of what you're shooting for moving forward it was it was funny because before I had one goal I wanted my name on a GB cap you know say I've represented my country and the first name I got on a GB cap was the Paralympic Games I was like oh, right that goal <laughs> done another goal was to make the podium potential squad I did that and I made them all up in um, lockdown and I achieved them all within three weeks. So it was like, oh, now what? Um, my long-term goal, you know, S6 categories are very competitive. There's lots and lots of swimmers. Um, you know, you've got to be very, very good to be on the top. My long-term goal is to make a final in the Paralympic Games by myself, not in a, in a relay. Um, then, you know, that'll be done. I'll... I don't know how long I'm going to do this for because, you know, you, the swimmer lifestyle, it's very demanding. You've got to get up early in the morning. You've got to miss out on social events, families. I think I've missed, you know, I've only been doing this for six years. I've missed out on eight or nine family holidays to train. Mm -hmm. um, all that family time I've sacrificed, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to do this for, but I would love, the other goal is to make the, big four competitions, which is Europeans, Worlds, Commonwealths, and Paralympics. They're the big four that we do. Um, and I've made two of them so far. The aim, if I can say I've done all four, I think that will be a pretty good way to um, close a book on the, my career. But we haven't got there yet. So um, I'm going on for the moment. Yeah. So, so before I get too far into the future, I do want to get your perspective on how swimming, especially as you picked it up, you know, a little later than most did at, at 14, how that has played into uh, your identity as someone who does have dwarfism. I've never felt more accepted in my entire life. You know, I've been introduced to so many incredible people. You know, I, never thought that I'd be friends with Ellie Simmons. Like, that's on, that blows my mind. To have a teammate and a training partner like Maisie Summers Newton, um, she's a good mate of mine. Uh, and I look up to her, you know. I'm older than her, I'm two years older than her, but I look up to her massively every day. Every day I want to think, I want to be like her. But in terms of an identity, there's no environment where I feel more comfortable. Northampton Swimming Club, you know, we've got... Four people with dwarfism currently um, of different ages. Um, and every single one of them feels accepted. I've, you know, I've talked to all of them the way we feel. Um, it's an area we can feel safe because when we go out in public, we have to be on our toes. We have to be vigilant. We have to be looking around. Who's saying what? Who's making what comment? But swimming, especially even at the big competitions, every, all swimmers around the UK and generally most competitions, 
um, around the world, they feel accepted because they are aware of what para swimming is, especially in Britain. It's a huge thing here. Um, I think what we won 26 medals at the games last year, I think. So they're all really aware. So I, don't have to look over my shoulder, look around when we're, you know, nationals or something like that, because, you know, for me, we're home. This is our festival. Everyone's accepted. Everything goes. So for me, swimming provides a comfort. It provides a bubble, which I don't really like going out of. So, you know, swimming, it's a, it's a safe home for me. So I guess to, to wrap this all up, to bring it full circle, you know, especially with the last few days, um, you know, you talked about how you might, obviously swimming won't be forever. Um, you have these goals that are like, well, if I do these, you know, I, I'd be happy calling it a career. H- how long do you see yourself swimming potentially? And do you have any idea of what might come for you after that? I've got a very good idea. So um, I won't. I won't say that I, I do know when I'll stop, but I won't say when it is um, because it might change. Um, but I've got a pretty good idea when. Um, but I've got plenty of contacts and ideas of what I want to do afterwards. I'm massively into cars, motorsport, racing, that sort of thing. I used to work in Formula One. I lost my job because of COVID and it gave me some experience. On, so I used to make parts out of carbon fiber for i was working in a contracting company that work that work for two f1 teams legally i can't say who they are um but they gave me some wonderful experience working with them i got to meet some very cool people and i know motorsports where i want to go i like um you can see i'm fiddling quite a bit i like working with my hands um, and I also like being in a competitive av- environment. I like talking. Um, and I believe that's exactly what I want to do afterwards. I'm very lucky I live half an hour away from Silverstone, which is where the British Grand Prix is held. It's the centre of European motorsport. Um, so it's all around here. So it would definitely be motorsport. And yeah, in terms of career, you know, those four big competitions, any medals are a bonus. I obviously I'll train as hard as I can for them. No medal is ever a guarantee. Um, unless you're Caleb Dressel. Uh, <laughs> but you know, for me, I've had such an incredible career. If I if I was, you know, 27, 28, I'd be very happy calling it now. But I've got more things, you know, I'm still young. I've got more in me to give. So I'd be happy calling it now, but I would be silly too because i know i can achieve more um especially with the tools i've been given at the moment it's and you know i love being part of this environment and it's you know what has really made me so proud is to see how well the post has gone around how everyone came together saying look at this look how awful this is people message me i never thought i would speak to some of these people um, I thought I was way below them, but I've got to have chats with some of the most interesting people. But all the community swimming community came together and shared this, saying, look what's happening to one of our swimmers. Look what's happening to Will. And look what it happens to everyone. You know, look what, look at this. And you know, I've never been more proud to be part of a community. It's unbelievable. Hearing that certainly warms my heart and makes makes me really happy that you shared that post, you spoke up, and, and hopefully we can see some sort of change moving forward um, around this topic. Will, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat with us today. It's been great getting your perspective on all these topics. Uh, are, are we missing anything? Do you have any parting thoughts before we sign off today? Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, and in terms of what I've been campaigning for for the last three days, um, you know, if you do see my post, please, you know, tell your friends about it. Tell your parents, saying, look what's happening. Just share it because every time you share it, maybe a few hundred more people will be exposed and go, wow, look what's going on. And then it goes, it's like a chain reaction. So please keep going or, you know, even if you can't, you know, Instagram on the post, just tell your friends 
um or you know even if it's just yourself think of us you know all different things you know we're no different we're normal we don't we don't want you guys to notice us in public you know as long as we can go around shopping you know meeting up with friends and family is normal then we're very happy and that's the way i want it to be but you know i can't praise the swimming community enough and not just in britain you know i've around the world from what i've got and it's unbelievable but yeah thank you so much for having me on You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.